two. Welcome back to the Biohacks podcast. Today we are joined by the legendary Dr. Bob or Dr. Robert Griffiths. Uh, he is a chiropractor. He's a very good friend of mine and we're going to be talking all things back pain. So uh, Bob, thanks for joining us today, mate. Hey Simon, welcome. No problem at all. Uh, um, so do you want to give the guys a bit of a rundown how you got your into your line of work, how you became a chiropractor? Yeah, sure. So I've been a chiropractor practicing for around sort of 14 years now, all in uh, based in London. <coughs> always had an interest in sport, always played to a, a relatively high level when I was a kid. And just, uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm a bit of a geek, sort of love to work out, you know, problems, solve problems. And that was, uh, that was effectively where I got into this. It's, um, it's a lovely line of work. You get to help people, get them fixed. And then my real passion, which is basically exercise-based uh, rehabilitation, it gets me using that with people every single day. Solid, solid. And what, what, what just as a query, what, what sports were you? Was it like rugby, football? combination of things really rugby athletics um those were the main ones and then tennis was on top of that uh, those were the kind of the, the three major ones but uh yeah if you asked my mum she would have told you that i was a complete pain in absolutely everything <laughs> Trying to do <laughs> just um, like come from you were son yeah no i can imagine <laughs> um and so and where did you where did you do all your studying where did you do chiropractic studies and stuff so studied uh, just north of Cardiff at uh, the Welsh Institute of Chiropractic. Uh, spent about five years down there doing um, doing my degree. And then I spent my postgraduate year back in London. Um, and after that, basically, you're autonomous. You're ready to, to practice as, a, as an individual. Nice and safe. Yeah, so, yeah it was good good times. It was a good experience in Wales with an English accent uh, <laughs> when, I was, uh, when, I was, when I was playing rugby. I used to get some good attention. That's nice. Good fun. <laughs> imagine um and and what kind of like so obviously we're going to talk we're going to go into a little bit about back pain and kind of the causes of and then what people like the practical tips that people can use to get themselves uh or to kind of cure it right um so what 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 is the kind of core reason that people normally get injured like into the back so like what would you see like on a day-to-day -day basis i'd say the um that's a really good one the single biggest one sitting Hands down, without fail, you know, the amount of sitting that we do, that is the biggest killer. Uh, I'd say probably 80 to 90% of the people I see with back pain, that is the, the biggest factor that they have. Um, you, you know, you can couple that together with weight, people being overweight, particularly it's, uh, is, is another one. And on top of that, then you get the kind of the weakness um, that you'll get with that. So you get weak muscles around the core stabilizers and those are the, the predominant factors that we see a lot of the time. Obviously, you get your traumatic sports injuries from people that are athletic, you know, so if people deadlifting, they tend to slip discs quite a lot. Um, if they're deadlifting poorly, deadlifting is not the thing, it's the way you deadlift, it's the problem. Uh, but most of the population, it'll be the quantity of sitting that they're doing at their desks, on their phones, on their laptops, all day, every single day. And when I've, when I've seen, like, you've helped me understand this a little bit, but so when I've seen, like, kind of the force numbers that are involved obviously when you're sat at your desk obviously that you have no base of support right I guess all exactly. of the upper body load like could you go into a little bit of the physics of it maybe just so people can understand yeah. so obviously if you if you basically think about the body in the terms of alignment if it's meant to be in a neutral upright posture you know that's the way we're designed to be and all the forces that are coming down on top of you there they are dispersed quite well by the spine they're designed to do that so the forces go through every individual disc in your spine and then your forces that are, are compressive forces are all dispersed quite effectively and shared amongst them. However, you plonk yourself on a chair for longer than 20 minutes and immediately all of those forces come to a stop right at the base of your spine and there's nowhere else for that force to go. So what you'll end up doing is, is effectively squeezing and, and like a donut being squashed down. You're going to squeeze that bottom lower two discs really mm -hmm. and the joints in there. And that will then increase the amount of pressure over time. And eventually the, the tolerances for that are, are very few, you know, very slim. You, you're not going to get be able to do that for a long period of time. Interesting. Yeah. Like, and I guess, and then, so within that, so obviously we understand, now we understand a little bit about the forces, I guess then the next thing on top of that, like exactly like you said, is that it's about habits and it's about the time that you spent there. Like I remember always seeing this stat that like when people are at their desk, it's like going on like a, a semi long haul flight, like on a yeah. daily basis, like five days. Yeah. Yeah, I, one of my favorite ways of framing it to people is to mention to them and just say, okay, so if you were to get a monkey and put it on a, in a chair and, st and make it stare at a screen for 12 hours and hit a tappy thing, and then at the end of the month, you threw money at it, 
you would be put in prison for cruelty. You'd be like, what are you doing to that poor monkey? Like, why on earth would you do that? Like, that's, that's the horrible thing to do. That monkey needs to be free, needs to run, needs to climb trees. But we seem to have sort of considered it an acceptable thing to do to a, to a human body, which is to basically sit there staring at a flashing, uh, flashing light and uh, getting rewarded with a, a bank account full of cash. It's, uh, it's an interesting concept. Information age, right? It's the capitalist. Yeah. That's the blame. If I, oh, wait, we'd all be back in the trees, mate. We'd all be, <laughs> we'd all be back <laughs> living off the land. <laughs> I think we've got a, there could be a revolution here, a foot here, I think. We're uh, starting something. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, brilliant. So we kind of understand the physics, um, compression on the lower discs. Then mixed in with that, it's obviously habits and the time in which the amount of time that people spend in these types of positions. Um, so s somebody comes in to you, they've got, say they've got a slip disc, they've got pain, potentially overweight, but what's your normal practice? Like what do you normally kind of, what, what's the normal kind of strategy to get them back? So, to yeah, it's a good question. So the protocols we tend to look at, there's, there's always a kind of systematic way of approaching it. Uh, the biggest thing is to remove the negatives. Okay, so that's the first thing we always look into doing. So we have a good discussion about what is going on in their life, their day to day, we call it their ADLs, their activities of daily living. What in their ADLs are they doing that is causing their problem? What got them into our office in the first place? And then you basically try and take them all, all away. And that's about 90% of your job done. So you tell them to stop, you know, stop going to work, stop doing all these things. But unfortunately, it's not always possible. So you have to make compromises, get standing desks. You have to get supportive cushions potentially to try and change postural habits. You have to look at uh, ways of taking breaks. These are all simple things that you can do on a, on a regular basis to interrupt those negative habits. Once you've done that, you're then looking for issues with flexibility. Um, I'd say that's that's kind of the next mechanical step that we look at. Um, prior to that, actually, I'd say one more thing. Actually, we, we actually look at emotion quite heavily a lot. Uh, I didn't used to do this in the start of my career at all. Basically, I'd just talk about the physics of it all and talk about the forces and everything involved and how the joints move. But these days, especially in the current climate, stress, anxiety, overload in terms of workload, we're seeing people all day, every day, getting wound up and just living on this kind of high revving adrenaline and cortisol um, sort of formula and recipe for disaster, effectively, where they're not breathing properly, they're not relaxed, they're constantly in that fight or flight response. And it just drives a hell of a lot of dysfunction into the system because when they're not happy, when they're not content, they're not breathing properly through their diaphragm, which means their core's not stabilizing. And that means they're using their traps and that means they're using their pecs to basically shrug up their shoulders. So that will push them into a state where they're rounding forwards, they're, they're hunched over the whole day and they're, they're consistently in these forward rounded positions. And honestly, you know, you can do all the flexibility work and all the stability work in the world, but if you don't clear that emotional component, then you're pretty much going to be seeing them coming back into your office again and again and again. So that's the biggest one that we clear sort of after we've spoken about the daily living things. Then it goes to flexibility. Where are they stiff? Is it genuinely a flexibility problem? Or is it actually because they've got stiffness in there because their brain is putting the stiffness in there? Is it on there, in there for a reason? Are your hamstrings tight because your brain wants them to be tight? So we look at that. We clear any genuine flexibility issues. And then after that, we'll look at stability. How strong are they? Can they stabilize in basic sort of you know, floor-based exercises? If they can, great. We move them on. If they can't, then we don't. We basically just stick with what we've got. So it's all dependent on the individual, obviously. It's all very tailored. And depending on the level of person, so if you get a high-end athlete, you know, you'll, get, you'll be dealing with them and a lot. You'll, you'll accept that they'll probably have a decent level of flexibility and stability. So then you can go into the more top-tier stuff, such as you know, how to deadlift, for example, um, like pretty, pretty quickly. But most people, you need to start right back at the beginning, regress everything and just look at the fundamentals. And then from there, you can expand. Quite interesting. It's a really it's such a great breakdown. Thank you for the, uh, to give people a bit of an understanding of the process that you work through. And I guess people come into you with just the symptom, right? They go, "Oh, I've got this symptom." And actually, yeah. what you're doing, what you're doing is with your job is that you're going to the root cause of everything. You're kind of breaking down what has led them to get to that space. What all they see is and feel is the pain, obviously, which is obviously very visceral. But what yeah. you're doing, from what I've understood, what you said is it's about breaking down and looking at what are the actual causing effects. Um, yeah, and peeling back the layers of that, you know, if they've got themselves in that, 
okay, it's through multiple reasons and you need to try and address all of them, not yeah. just the mechanical. Um, and, you know, that goes as far as looking at things like diet as well. You know, if they're off their face on caffeine and sugar and or, you know, sleep as well, you know, these are, these are things that, you know, you can't get away from. All the inflammatory driven processes, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we look at all of that, you know, sleep is, is a massive one as well. You know, what's their sleep profile like? Um, you know, what's their general diet like? Do they do they have a bunch of processed junk like passing through the system day in, day out? If they do, that needs to change, you know? Mm, 100%. And I guess that maybe the, pe the pain is like a stimulus or catalyst for like maybe making a change. The greatest motivator known to man. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> that, that, honestly, like... Uh, People don't come into me because they want their cortisol level. You know, that, that, is, that is a fact. They, they come and say, oh, I'm, a, I'm a, little bit, a little bit in fight or flight mode. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, pain, is, pain is the catalyst for it. But hopefully with a good explanation, you can get them on board and understanding why they need to do certain things to get their basics. You know, get, turn those bad habits into good habits, effectively. I went to see um, Steve Peters talk, you know, the, uh, yeah, yeah. Like a, few, a couple of years yeah. ago. Uh, he was talking live in Kensington. I went to watch, and the biggest thing that stuck with me from the kind of whole com whole uh, whole talk was this idea that he said in life that humans obviously it's much easier, much more efficient for us to kind of stay in stasis, and like we only ever really make a change if we've suffered enough, which is the first thing, or yep. if we ever have a great enough will. Um, yep. And it was quite interesting. Yeah, that is exactly it. Yeah, if you hit rock <laughs> bottom or you're in agony, guess what? You're going to find out why, right? Yeah. It's like no, or brilliant. you're one of the you know complete high achiever profile types, a one driven character that just wants to just keep optimizing, you know, and and both both can have their pros and both can have their cons. Hundred percent, brilliant. So yeah. that's given everybody a kind of um a kind of uh, three sixty view of the. You come in, you have back pain, but there's obviously more. Obviously within that there are particular like skeletal things that need to be addressed, but obviously it's multifactorial and this is something obviously I've been trying to get across with a lot of these podcasts is that it's never just as simple as you kind of think there's obviously multi multi layers to it. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one of the, the things that uh, I find oversimplifying a complex problem is a wonderful, it's a very Twitter friendly and very um, Instagram friendly uh, way of trying to sit and view things. And, and the truth is that as humans, we have, a lot more depth to us uh, than just one layer. And if it is, you know, look, if a 22 year old uh, chilled out, easygoing character has just slipped off of a, a curb and has pranged their back, I'm not going to start talking to him about his, you know, <laughs> sort of, uh, how, his, how his trapezius like muscles are balance and... firing. Yeah, because his cortisol levels are out of whack. But, you know, that isn't why most people come to see me. You know, you'll, you'll see most people mid 30s plus. Um, where they've been habitually just creating these bad mechanics over time due to these various reasons. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, to, getting into those deeper layers, they, they really appreciate that, we find. But, you know, you can talk to them on a, on a surface level and, and they'll, they'll be perfectly content. But if you really understand, you get to bother to understand, take the time to work out what is going on with the person, mm -hmm. the human, then that's when they really feel like, you know, they're actually really resetting themselves properly, thoroughly, you know? Mm -hmm. 100% no huge respect that's um that's really insightful thank you buddy um so let's go in, let's uh, let's go into the kind of the three exercises that we mentioned so um we were just discussing actually before we came on about that we it's probably going to be a bit difficult for bob to uh, demonstrate and talk at the same time so what we're going to try and do is we're going to leave some links in the description section below um and we'll kind of bob will give you kind of an overview of each of the exercises now and then we can leave those links for anybody who is currently sat watching this suffering and pain um this is this will hopefully help to kind of move you in the right direction so um yeah, yeah should, should we get make it nice and polished rather than me trying to fudge it in uh on, on a, on a well, I'll, I'll get my uh my, my wife to to film me doing it properly excellent, so you can get it properly. <laughs> um, let's so, get into yeah of course so number one let's uh let's get people breathing okay that's the first thing that we have to do if you're fixing any problem at all you've got to get their breathing right uh, it doesn't seem like that big a deal. You're thinking, well, okay, I've got back pain. What on earth has my breathing got to do with it? Now, the reason for it, and it's always good to understand why you're doing something rather than just some old bloke screaming at you to do it. What you've got to do is you've got to think about that core of yours, which is the, the muscle surrounding your spine. And if you've got that column um, of support around your spine, you've got the side walls, which are here. You've got the front and the back. You've got all 360 degrees of that, of that musculature that you need to have working well. You also need the floor, which is the pelvic floor. You also need the roof, which is the diaphragm. Now, as your muscles contract 
and expand when you're breathing, your diaphragm will go up and down accordingly. When you're doing that, that's generating a level of tone and stability throughout your lumbar spine. And that is what we need to create a good solid platform for movement. So if we've got good, simple mechanics where our breathing is good, then all of those muscles will fire in unison. They'll have a nice coordinated effort. Now, the way to think of it, and I always tell people this, is that you don't want them all firing at the same time. It's, an, it's like an orchestra, right? If every single band member went mental and started playing as loud <laughs> hard as they could you'd leave right you'd be like this is rubbish i'm leaving it's the same with your core okay you don't want all of those muscles rocking hard as you can as hard, like you're just going to ruin everything it's going to clamp down you're going to create artificial muscular activation patterns and more importantly when you go to do something in real life such as pick up your kid or your shopping or whatever you're not going to do that you're you're, you're not going to go right okay here comes the shopping you know brace everything and lock it all out so we want to coordinate that breathing because that just gets you into that nice relaxed mat pattern. It will also then allow you to then simulate real life situations as well, which is you know exactly what we want to try and replicate. So the way to do that is I'll just run through a brief one because this one's relatively easy for me to, uh, to demonstrate for you on the vid. But if, uh, if you just put your hands effectively around your torso, so just into the middle of your waist, what you're going to feel is you can feel the muscles. They should, when you breathe in, they should gently expand and you should feel your hands moving ever so slightly outwards. Now that should apply to all 360 degrees of the core. You should have everything expanding in a nice equal pattern. Now we're not looking to force that. We're not looking to basically expand it, you know, aggressively here. It's about relaxing, letting everything else just chill out, let those shoulders, let your jaw drop for the first time in the day. Just, you know, stop, switch off your brain for a sec. Let everything chill out, and then once those expansion uh, muscle, those expansion movements are occurring all throughout there, you'll feel effectively that that diaphragm is just doing its job. It's the way it's designed to work. It's the day, you know it's the way you should be seeing it. If you ever watch a um, a, a weightlifter, a, a really sort of you know Olympic level uh, weightlifter, you watch them doing a bunch of huge belly expansions before they lift. It's because they want that core switched on, fired up, and everything in there working. Now. They go to the next level because they're maxing out so they then do breath holding work but we don't do that in real life so we don't need to we can breathe in and out smoothly as we go so well i was gonna say from what i've understood my limited experience of it but like this idea that on an extreme level what you're referring to is this idea of like intra-abdominal pressure um yeah. in terms of the scientific scientific name and i guess yeah. that's, that's a really good way to describe it using the olympic lifter um obviously they take the whole idea is obviously they're taking more air in to increase yeah the tension and the stability yep. of the spine. Um, exactly. It's just a really good vi visual way for people to visualize it, I guess, obviously on an extreme level. Um, yep. I think that's, no, that's exactly right. And if you've got that spinal stability, then guess what? You can then fire your peripheral limbs, your legs and your arms can generate more force because they're firing from an anchored point. The old adage that you say, well, you can't fire a cannon from a rowing boat. You know, <laughs> if you've got stability and you fire a cannon from boom, the rowing boat's going to move back. You, the, the cannon's not going to go very far. Yep. You anchor it to the floor, give it some stability, boom, and all of a sudden that cannonball flies, right? So that's what we're talking about is giving to generate power, something that you you need. You need that base of support. You need that anchor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, and the way you've explained it to me in the past, this idea about like a lot of people can end up shallow breathing and end up, you explain the four different quadrants for me, like the two top ones. And most people, rather than breathing from the kind of, uh, kind of all four in sync, you end up breathing from the top two and the bottom exactly. two quadrants don't get full if that's, that's and that is spot on, mate. You'll find that the majority of people, especially if they're in a pain response mode, you know, if they're, if they're kind of, bodies in any any kind of uh, state of anxiety pain related or whatever related anxiety emotional or otherwise you'll find that those shoulders will start driving upwards you'll start finding that they'll shrug it inwards pecs will become dominant your round forward posture goes to whack and then you end up causing more disc problems so it just feeds itself again and again so there's no point in starting off with a bunch of uh, of upward dogs or any kind of planks or anything like that if you're um unless you're doing that breathing and this should apply just quickly just uh, throughout all of your exercises you know when you're doing all your rehab when you're doing all of your exercises in the gym breathe for the love of god breathe and if you're clenching your jaw and if you're holding your breath and you're doing all these things unless you are an olympic lifter and you're being told to do that by a coach 
don't do it because it's not doing you any favours. You're just making yourself, you're winding yourself into an injury state. So yeah, best avoided. All right. Fantastic. What a great rundown. That's absolute gold. Brilliant. Thank you, buddy. Um, number two, should we go into the second one? Yeah. All good. So effectively, once we've got you breathing, the next thing that we want to think about doing is getting some flexibility into the main areas of your body, which matter. Now, hip flexibility for back pain, no matter what type of back pain you've got, is a massive area that you can target very easily okay because obviously there's various types of back pain so today i'm going to give you some nice general things that will apply to all levels of back of lower back pain okay for different reasons so hip flexibility is is the, the biggest thing that we see in terms of a flexibility deficit in most people and it's normally through the front it will be your psoas that's causing you the trouble that's the hip flexor on the front of your thigh which we find just in here and in here that runs down into the groin and attaches on the inside of the thigh now if you're getting irritation within that area, if you're finding that there's stiffness and restriction due to you sitting too much, driving too much, just not spending enough time mobilizing and releasing tension from your system, then that psoas is always going to be either too tight or too switched on, okay? And it's gonna basically be, be either or. And now, in most people, it's tight. It's just that it's actually locked up over time because they've effectively just shortened it and contracted it. They've actually dropped sarcomeres, which are like the units of muscle, over time in that muscle because it's just never been asked to open up. So the thing that we want to get people doing is getting that smooth opening stretch where we get effectively the front of that left thigh will get opened up. And the exercise that I'll give you, we'll do it up. It's called a couch exercise. It was made popular by a guy called Kelly Starrett. And he effectively just opened up the idea that if that muscle is restricted, then effectively you're not going to really get anywhere. You're not going to be able to perform many human movements because you'll always be compensating around that lack of, uh, lack of hip extension effectively. And I think it's quite interesting, I think, from what I've understood about the psoas, obviously, because it's, it crosses such a big joint and it's obviously attached to two very kind of key points, uh, two, two key parts of your body, right? Obviously, your leg and the bottom base of your spine and obviously creates hip flexion. I guess it's so, like, yeah. key for... Um, That's exactly... It's the only muscle in the body which connects the upper and the lower body are properly. You know, you've got the psoas true, which is the one that really does that, but then the iliacus, which is next to it, which is a different muscle. They share a tendon sheet, but they're, they're different muscles. Um, that Those two are, are, are the primary drivers of this, but it's mainly the psoas that we're talking about because that's what's going to then, it's either going to pull you into a really sort of large state of hyperextension and give you that big curve in your lower back, give you the duck butt thing that's going on in a lot of athletes you'll find that um or if it's uh, you know the, the other thing is that it might actually just cause compression of the lumbar discs when you when you're doing activity because it's, it's really restricted so you're constantly instead of being able to, to maintain spinal extension you have to round forwards um in order to try and perform the movement if you want to pick a ball up off the floor you can't maintain a relatively neutral spine so because your hips aren't flexible enough and that psoas is cramping down so you have to then create another problem, which is uh, which is going to be in your discs in your in your lower back instead. And it also, I guess, it all has a knock-on effect. Is obviously what you're kind of alluding to here, like yeah, exactly. So that and that's the starting point for the back pain. You know, that's the thing is that if that breathing's out of whack, and then you've got yourself a really tight psoas later later down the line, problems just start stacking up, and you won't notice them when you're twenty. No one, no one really does. If you're, you know, unless you're really at a high level with sports, you really like. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> put a few duty cycles through there once you put a few few hours in the, in the tank you'll you'll definitely start to see things creep, creeping up and you know we obviously get 20 somethings in with lower back problems but they tend to be people that are either high end you know decent athletes like you know like you are were um you know that <laughs> so with that you know you'll see people that were you know have been training a lot and testing themselves and asking big questions of their body on a regular basis so they're stress testing themselves that's a slightly different story but if you're just a regular joe who just enjoys a bit of gym and enjoys a bit of a, a workout or a bit of sport and you're starting to get problems you won't really see them until later on about 30 plus interesting and so like so basically yeah so some some people have bring theirs on early and some just happen by time yeah. time <laughs> time passing death by a thousand cuts you get that kind of micro trauma <laughs> when you're just rip feeding a little bit of annoyance into the system every single day and it doesn't matter you know if you're, if you're pouring petrol on that fire in one big go or if you're drip feeding it on it's still <laughs> <laughs> you burn, you know, that's the problem. 
such a good analogy. So we've got, so first of all, we've got breathing, look at your breathing mechanics. And second of all, yeah. basically looking at the psoas and psoas tightness. And obviously, like we said, there's going to be a, a link in the description below. So brilliant. yeah, um, absolute gold. Awesome. Um, if we go into just the, the third and final one, I don't want to keep you for too much longer because I know we're. No, okay. So yeah, number three, once you've got the breathing sorted and you get hip extension returning, once you, it doesn't have to be perfect, by the way. We don't have to get this thing like looking like a ballerina, right? Um, we, we just need it to be better than it was. They just to start showing some signs of, uh, of opening up. Uh, and then what you'll find is that if you can get those two things right, then you add some stability, okay? So you start getting some core strength, okay? Now, I would say, hand on heart, that it is weak, in i probably say 100 percent of people okay so even my strongest strongest athletes do not have if they number one their core normally isn't activating so the ignition to the to the engine isn't turned on but even if it is uh, if it is activating by some miracle they don't generally have enough either strength or reactivity so the ability to adapt to an external environment so for normal people, regular Joes, everyone that's sort of, you know, your average person, you just need to get some strength in there to start off with. That's your basics. We get that in. And then after that, we start adding in a little bit of variety. So we start you off by doing a really simple plank. And just a, that's just a neutral plank. If, you, if that's too much for you, you do it kneeling. If that's too much for you, you do it up and ele elevated up on a, on a bench. So you're regressing the exercise smoothly. And then once that plank is stable and you're managing to hold that, for around kind of like 45 to 60 seconds. Then we get you doing some seesaw planks where you're rocking forwards and backwards with your toes. Or we get you doing some reaching planks and clock planks where you're moving your hand out to the side and doing all these kind of disco moves. That's just to add a little bit of reactivity. So the core itself it has, a, it has a lot of functions. It has a stabilizing function and a strength function just for holding you upright all day long. But it also has an ability to adapt to things. So let's say you roll your ankle, you're on a curb, you're walking along, that ankle goes. Your core, before you even hit the floor with your ankle, it knows that something's happening and it's then gonna go bang. Okay, right, I need to now brace up and be ready to prepare for this. Mm. So it has that role as well, which we need to train it for in, in tandem with a, a nice, slow, long burning, steady state of strength, which will just maintain good form throughout the day. So you've got to, tear it up you've got to layer it up you go with the basic stuff originally and then you go into those bigger ones later on so planking is definitely the, the move that you want to start off with in really simple terms fantastic that's such a great rundown on the so on the plank because obviously there's could be a little bit of the mythology around this like you see different people doing it in different ways so we're yeah. talking about for stability we're talking about neutral spine because obviously one of the most common things you'll see people doing is obviously the yeah, like t tucking in on the front, uh, engaging the ab abdomen, because obviously they want to turn it into an ab exercise. Um, yep. And obviously that throws the pelvis into uh, posterior, posterior rotation, am I correct? Yeah, posterior yeah, rotation. Yeah, depending on, on the individual. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, that's the, that is a big thing, actually, for, for a lot of people. They do the, the you know, the, the suck up, the belly button to the spine, the draw in, the pilates, whatever you want to call it. You know, and it's this thing where you're effectively just trying to... <laughs> Coactivate is the technical term, which means you're, you're sucking in a muscle called your TVA, your transverse abdominus, and it's trying, to, it's trying to brace your spine and create a sense of security. You know, there was a study done back in the 80s, which about you know, every single person since has rubbished, but it, it effectively showed that people with strong TVAs, transverse abdominus muscles, i.e. their ability to suck their belly button in was good. It, they didn't have back pain. So everyone jumped on this bandwagon and started going crazy and said, oh, TBA strength is the way to cure back pain. Mm. And it's not. If you look back at, if you think back to what I was saying about the orchestra, you know, if you've got, you know, imagine that one member of the band just playing so loud the whole time, mm. the others aren't going to get a look in. You know, you're not representing real life situations. You're not stabilizing in an effective pattern. And when you're on a, on a on sports field, you're running around, you go to catch that ball, you're not thinking, right, I should probably suck my belly button in right now. You know, that's, that's or someone comes to hit you, you know, you don't suck the belly button in. I don't open that door behind me by so sucking the belly button. So why, why would you try and practice that? I don't understand the, 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 the sort of the reasoning behind it. So that's kind of gone out the window a lot. So the best thing to do is to try and find neutral. And what find neutral, what we simply get people to do is we get them to tuck their bum out as far as they can, go Donald Duck as far as they can go backwards, tuck their bum under as far as they can, 
and then just find the middle third between that somewhere, okay? So you're not going all the way out, you're not going all the way under, you're going sort of middle third between those three. Mm. And that will get you roughly where you need to be. You know, it doesn't need to be absolutely perfect, it's a range, it's not a dead spot, so you don't have to be like, oh, am I exactly there? Just within that middle third, that's a nice place to be. And if you can do that when you're planking as well, it'll give you that neutral posture, good activation levels. Remember, you're breathing the whole time as you're doing all these exercises anyway. Mm. So that's going to give you that expansion and that activation pattern. And then you add a little bit of variety in later to really challenge yourself. So those are the moves that we would want you um, sort of starting off with, no matter what kind of back pain you've got. Obviously, if you're super, super acute, you've got you know pain that started yesterday and it's 10 out of 10, this isn't for you. You know, This is something for people that have been dealing with it for a while and they're looking to unlock some key things. But yeah, you, you can really do some, uh, some good stuff just by clearing these three basics. And obviously, the, the good thing is you get those three right. You, then you go see someone, they're all going to love you. You know, they're going to think to you, I think, okay, this, this girl is absolutely switched on. You know, she's smashing it because she's, she's decided that she's already going to chill herself out, breathing right, get hip flexibility, get hip extension back, and then get some core activation. You know, you can start working on the more fun stuff after that. You know, it's, uh, it's the good groundwork. And I think it's really interesting. And I guess it's something just to add on to that. I guess that even if you haven't got back pain yet, it's like these types of exercises the bobs are showing you it can be set back into your program as warm up to basically prevent it from ever happening. And obviously, it's like the old adage that you, you you don't really know how important it is until obviously you need it. But I guess if you're trying to if you're trying to if your program is about health and optimizing your kind of health and performance, then these yep. these types of exercises can easily sit in your warm up as a preventative measure. I guess as well. Yeah, exactly that. I would say uh, it's, it forms the basis of, of my warm-ups for my personal training routine. It forms the basis of every single person I, uh, I give it to, you know, from, from a back pain perspective, and even not a back pain perspective, even if you've got a shoulder problem or whatever, you know, it, it's, it's only going to do you some favours, right? It's not, not going to do you any harm. So um, working through that, it's, it's a great intro into, into getting the body primed, ready to work from a neurological level. Uh, rather than just getting sweaty, you know, just trying to get, do five minutes on the treadmill. Instead, do 30 seconds of breathing, 30 seconds to a minute of, uh, of mobility work on those, uh, on those hip flexors. Then you do 30 seconds to 60 seconds of plank, depending on your level. And then bang, two minutes later, your body's primed, ready to roll. You have co-activation throughout all your core work, muscles are working well. A little bit of glute work after that, and you're, you're pretty much off. Wow, perfect. Such a good rundown. We've made it sound super simple. We've just kind of okay. blown straight through it. No, it's, it's, it's back really... pain done. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> one hundred and one. Bob, if anybody, um, we're going to get you back on to talk about some kind of some more, um, some kind of more yeah. other uh, other areas that you think are kind of going to be helpful for people. If people want to find out more about you. Obviously, we've got we can leave a link in the in the comment section below. Um, yeah. No stress. Yeah, if you want to uh, check uh, check out the clinic, it's uh, www.properformanceclinicswithans.com. I'm based in Notting Hill and the city in London. Uh, and uh, basically, if you want to just uh, get in, in touch, you know, in any way, I can always try and help you out in some way, even if you want to do a Zoom chat or whatever it is. So please just feel free to contact me. Info at properformanceclinics.com is the email and uh, you can check the website out as well. Brilliant. Guys, I hope you thought that was super helpful. Um, if you have, make sure you hit the like button for us and also hit the subscription button and the notification bell as well. Uh, obviously, it helps the YouTube algorithm and helps us grow this channel. So, um, Bob, really appreciate your time, but I hope to see you soon. No worries. Good luck with everything. I'll see you soon, yeah? Cheers, mate.